My name is Fernando Florido and I am a GP in the United Kingdom. In today's video, I am going to go through the American Diabetes Association and the European Association for the Study of Diabetes consensus guidelines on the overall approach in glucose lowering medication in type 2 diabetes. I will firstly give you a list of the changes to the previous recommendations followed by a description of the consensus recommendations flowchart. If you have been following previous episodes, you may be familiar with the updated NICE guidelines on the management of type 2 diabetes. However, the NICE recommendations, primarily followed in the UK, have some substantial differences when compared to other international recommendations, and this is why I have decided to do this video today. You will notice that the main difference with NICE refers to the use of GLP-1 mimetics, which NICE considers to be less cost-effective. However, from a clinical perspective, there is now ample evidence in their favour, which justifies a wider use as described in the consensus guidelines. I will put in the description below a link to download the food article as well as the summary of the changes and the flowchart. There is a podcast version of this episode, another th clinical guidance, and a link to access it can also be found in the description below. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Right, let's go straight in. So we're going to start looking at the European Association for the Study of Diabetes and American Diabetes Association consensus guidelines on managing hyperglycemia in type 2 diabetes, published in December 2019, corrected in May 2020, but I've put links in the video description. Now this is the flowchart that we're going to look at in quite a bit of detail, but before going to that, we're going to go through the changes to the consensus recommendations. And this is just a brief summary of what the changes are. As a general consideration, we will say that in high-risk patients, the decision to treat with a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor should be considered independently of the HbA1c. This is because these agents have been proven to reduce MACE or major adverse cardiovascular events, HHF or hospitalization for heart failure, cardiovascular death or CKD progression. Now, in terms of GLP-1 receptor agonist, we will say that in patients with established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, the level of evidence is greatest for GLP-1 receptor agonist, and this is in terms of reducing major adverse cardiovascular events. And because of this, to reduce this risk, the GLP-1 receptor agonist can also be considered in patients who have not got cardiovascular disease but who are at high risk. Now for SGLT2 inhibitors, for patients with heart failure, especially if they have heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, that is an ejection fraction less than 45%, or CKD with an EGFR between 30 and 60 and Microalbuminuria with an urine albumin creatinine ratio greater than 30, particularly if it's greater than 300, the level of evidence is greatest for SGLT2 inhibitors. So, SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended with patients with heart failure to reduce the risk, and equally, the SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended for patients with CKD to prevent progression of CKD as well as the cardiovascular outcomes. Obviously because there is a link between SGLT2 inhibitors and an increased risk of amputation, patients with foot ulcers or at high risk of amputation should only be treated with SGLT2 inhibitors after careful shared decision making around the risks and benefits and with comprehensive education and foot care and amputation prevention. Right, so that was our summary of the changes. 
Now we're going to dive in straight into the flow chart. And as you can see, this is the overall approach of glucose lowering medication in type 2 diabetes. And it tells us here that to avoid inertia, we need to review the patients regularly, ideally every three or six months. Now, the first line therapy is always metformin and comprehensive lifestyle, including weight management and physical activity. So metformin, first of all, and then we're going to see if there are indicators of high risk or established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, CKD or heart failure. And then we will consider independently of the HbA1c the treatment. Now it will depend whether cardiovascular disease predominates or heart failure or CKD predominates. So if atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease predominates in the patient either because there is this established cardiovascular disease or there are indicators of high risk for cardiovascular disease then we will preferably give a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular disease benefit. And the proven cardiovascular benefit means that it has a label indication for reducing cardiovascular events. If you can't give or don't want to give a GLP-1 receptor agonist, then we will give an SGLT2 inhibitor with proven cardiovascular benefit as long as the EGFR is adequate because we have to be aware that SGLT2 inhibitor labeling varies by region and individual agent with regard to indicate the level of EGFR for initiation and continued use. So we we'll repeat again independently of the HbA1c if cardiovascular disease predominates we will give either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And then we will look at the HbA1c. And if the HbA1c remains above the target, then we will consider further intensification. And basically, for patients who are on GLP-1 receptor agonist, we will give an SGLT2 inhibitor and likewise, if they had an SGLT2 inhibitor, we will give them a GLP-1 receptor agonist. As an alternative, we can give a DPP-4 inhibitor if the patient is not on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. This is because of the mode of action. Or we can also give basal insulin, pioglitazone, or sulfonylurea. So we're just going to mix and match those agents always preferably starting with GLP-1 receptor agonists, then SGLT2 inhibitors. We can give a DPP-4 inhibitor if they're not on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, basal insulin, pioglitazone, or sulfonylurea. And it will tell us here that Degludec and U100 glargine have demonstrated cardiovascular disease safety in terms of pioglitazone. It tells us that low dose may be better tolerated, though less well studied for cardiovascular effects. And in terms of sulfonylurea, it reminds us that we should choose later generation sulfonylurea to lower the risk of hypoglycemia. And glimepiride has shown similar cardiovascular safety to the DPP-4 inhibitors. So again, that concludes the section where cardiovascular disease predominates. Now, if heart failure or CKD predominates, particularly if it's reduced ejection fraction or CKD specifically with an EGFR between 30 and 60 and macroalbuminuria at least 30 milligrams per gram or more, we will use preferably an SGLT2 inhibitor with evidence of reducing heart failure and or CKD progression in cardiovascular outcome trials as long as the EGFR is adequate. So 
it tells us here the empaglifosin, canaglifosin and apaglifosin have shown reduction in heart failure and also reduced CKD progression in cardiovascular outcome trials. Canaglifosin has primary renal outcome data from credence and dapaglifosin has primary heart failure outcome from DAPA heart failure. But this is becoming less and less relevant because it's now increasingly thought that the SGLT2 inhibitors have a class effect. Now, if an SGLT2 inhibitor is not tolerated or contraindicated, or if the EGFR is less than adequate, we will add a GLP-1 receptor agonist with proven cardiovascular benefit. So it's more or less the other way around from the cardiovascular disease branch. There we gave GLP first and then SGLT2. Here we're going to give SGLT2 inhibitor first and then GLP-1 receptor agonist second. And we need to remember that if the patient has heart failure or CKD, we will consider these treatments independently of the HbA1c. So we will give you SGLT2 inhibitors or your GLP-1 receptor agonists. And then, if the HbA1c is above the target, then we have to consider that we need to avoid pioglitazone in the setting of heart failure because it tends to worsen it because of fluid retention. We will try to stick to agents with a cardiovascular safety. So for patients on an SGLT2 inhibitor, we will consider the GLP-1 receptor agonist, or we can give a DDP-4 inhibitor, but not saxagliptin in the setting of heart failure, if they're not on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, or we can give basal insulin or sulfonylurea. So basically, after an SGLT2 inhibitor and a GLP-1 receptor agonist, if we need to give any more drugs, we will avoid pioglitazone and saxagliptin in the setting of heart failure. We can consider a DPP-4 inhibitor if they're not on a GLP-1 receptor agonist or basal insulin or a sulfonylurea. So that ends the branch of heart failure or CKD patients. Right, so we've now covered both if the patient has got cardiovascular disease or heart failure or CKD. But if the patients have not got those conditions and is not at high risk of those conditions, then we will be guided by the HbA1c. So we give metformin and then we'll be guided by the HbA1c in order to give more treatment. And we will divide this treatment depending on whether we want to minimize hypoglycemia, we want to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss, or whether cost is a major issue. So we divide the treatment on whether we focus on hypoglycemia, on weight, or on cost. Now let's look at the branch where hypoglycemia is our priority. And for those patients, we will use any of those agents, a DPP-4 inhibitor, GLP-1 receptor agonist, SGLT2 inhibitor, or pioglitazone, because none of them is associated with hypoglycemia. So we give dual therapy with metformin and one of those drugs. If the HbA1c remains above target, then we will give triple therapy. We will use any combination, bearing in mind that we must not give a combination of GLP-1 receptor agonist and a DPP-4 inhibitor, but all other combinations are allowed. And if the HbA1c remains above target on triple therapy, we will continue with additions of other agents, so we can go to quadruple therapy. If the HbA1c is above target, then we will consider the addition of a sulfonylurea or basal insulin. And with sulfonylureas, we will choose the later generation sulfonylurea with lower risk of hypoglycemia, such as glimepiride, or we'll consider a basal insulin with lower risk of hypoglycemia.
and here it tells us that the lowest risk of hypoglycemia is Degludeg Glargin U300 followed by Glargin U100 Detamir and then NPH insulin. Now if we're going to focus on the weight because we need to minimize weight gain or promote weight loss then we will give either a GLP-1 receptor agonist or an SGLT2 inhibitor. And GLP-1 receptor agonist with good efficacy for weight loss. Here it tells us that the best one is semaglutide, followed by liraglutide, gelaglutide, exenatide, and lixisenatide. So if we can, we will give them always either semaglutide or liraglutide. And then, if the HbA1c remains above target, then we will give the opposite. So if the patient has had a GLP-1 receptor agonist, we will give an SGLT2 inhibitor. And if they have had an SGLT2 inhibitor, then we will give a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And if the HbA1c remains above target, then we're going to quadruple therapy, because the patient is already on metformin, GLP-1 receptor agonist and an SGLT2 inhibitor. But if that's not tolerated or contraindicated, the lowest risk of weight gain is a DPP-4 inhibitor. But that can only be given if the patient is not already on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. And this is because the DPP-4 inhibitor has got weight neutrality. If the DPP-4 inhibitor is not tolerated or contraindicated, or if the patient is already on a GLP-1 receptor agonist, we should use cautiously sulfonylurea, pioglitazone or basal insulin. And this is because all these agents are associated with weight gain. And finally, if we're going to focus on the cost, because cost is the major issue, and it's going to tell us here when cost should be a major issue. So cost should be our focus if there are no specific comorbidities, so no established cardiovascular disease, low risk of hypoglycemia, and weight is not a real concern. And also in terms of cost, we will need to consider country and region-specific cost of drugs, because in some countries, for example, pioglitazone can be relatively more expensive and DPP-4 inhibitors relatively cheaper. But basically, if cost is a concern, we will start with either a sulfonylurea or pioglitazone, which are the cheapest agents. And if the HbA1c is above target, we're going to triple therapy. So that will be metformin, sulfonylurea and pioglitazone. And if the HbA1c remains above target, then we will consider either insulin therapy as a basal insulin with the lowest acquisition cost, or we can consider DPP-4 inhibitors or SGLT2 inhibitors with the lowest acquisition cost. So basically we go into quadruple therapy according to whatever is the most cost-effective combination. Right, so this is it. So we have completed the review of these consensus flowchart. This is the end of this video and the summary of the consensus recommendations. If you have found it useful, please make sure that you hit the like and subscribe buttons. There is also a podcast version in the Diabetes in Primary Care podcast and the Clinical Guidelines in Primary Care podcast. And I will leave a link in the description below. Thank you for watching and hope that you will join me in the next one.